Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Yeah, you can just. <laughs> I'm Maddie Buris on Castora's marketing team, and I'm really excited to be here today with Corey Pearson, Castora's founder and CEO, especially because this is a topic that is very near and dear to his heart. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we try to do these webinars for retail marketers about two times a month, and we pick the topics based on what is of interest to you guys. Um, so please, after the webinar, we would really appreciate it if you fill out a very quick survey um, on what you liked, what we can improve, and some topics you're interested in hearing about next. Um, if you have a question, please chat it into the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to get to it at the end. If we don't, then we will definitely follow up via email. Um, generally, I say these are more podcast style, so if you can't look at the slides, it's okay. But today, we have some really awesome slides. They're very detailed, and I think they'll really help to illustrate what Corey's going to talk about. So if you can, try to take a look at them. Um, and then, as always, we will share the deck and the recording afterwards. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Corey, who will tell you about what we're going to talk about today. Adjusting the mic. All right. Thank you, Maddie. Um, so yeah, so today we're going to talk about reporting um, and particularly reporting for senior management within the retail uh, universe. Um, the way we're going to tell this story is by making it a bit real. Uh, I think one of the challenges when preaching the gospel of customer centricity is that it's kind of fuzzy. Like what exactly does it look like? What decisions change? What types of insights make a difference? Um, it's very easy for us and our academic and you know theoretical minds to talk about the notion of customer lifetime value. Um, but when the rubber hits the road, we find that things often kind of fall apart or get so fuzzy that they just don't happen. And so today we're gonna we're gonna try to illustrate with a couple of examples of sample reports, a little bit of a of a before and after, um, with some talk about some decisions that uh, that change. Uh, we base this off real case studies, real things that we've seen our customers use. So uh, we hope that you find it interesting. And as Maddie said, please don't hesitate to pop questions in throughout. Um, and we'll do our best to answer all of them at the end. Um, so a bit of background about us. Um, if if uh, you haven't heard of us, Castor is a customer intelligence platform. And we work with a lot of the top retailers in the world. Um, we uh, are a, a solution that uh, sits sort of on top of raw customer data sources. Think online purchases, offline purchases, CRM, email. Uh, we pull all that data together. We run a whole bunch of wonderful predictive analytics to surface customer insights. And then uh, once that data is together, we do a lot of work to make sure that retailers can use that data. That means improving marketing touch points. That means uh, flowing customer centric information into the C-suite to make decisions like we're talking about today. But it's really about helping retailers keep in control of their customer data to grow lifetime value. But to the point I just made earlier to make that real, not just a fuzzy concept. So uh, getting in to, um, into the meat of today's presentation, uh, as most of us know, retail is primarily a product centric and, and channel centric world today. Um, of course, every retailer we talk to loves their customers. Um, and that's one of the challenges in talking about something like customer centric reporting is like, you know, I don't think I've ever met a company that's like, nah, we're not customer centric. We don't give a damn about our customers. Like, of course everybody does. Um, but what it means, I think, and, and that this is part of the, you know, the first step of, of defuzzying, clarifying maybe would be another way. Um, what this means is, if you think about most reports that flow around in an organization, um, in the uh, in the in the C-suite, you'll see things about in-store sales are up year over year, online sales are up year over year. In the marketing department, you'll see email revenue, you'll see Google search revenue, you'll see social revenue. Uh, all of these things are channel-centric reporting, and they all make sense, right? We're not here to throw shade on the types of reports that are flowing through the organization because they are very, very meaningful. But what we don't see a lot of um, are the things we'll get in today, which are 
really interesting insights about customer behavior that is causing those chains changes. Um, so we'll get into some of that in a bit. Uh, another challenge is that most reporting, for obvious reasons, is descriptive, historical, and um, that also makes sense. You should look about, you know, look at what happened. Uh, but with the state of predictive analytics today, you can get a better sense of not only what happened, but what does that look like in the like what are the implications of this? How are things trending in the future? Um, and so. Generally speaking, we see that there's quite a bit of improvement to not only say, hey, year over year sales are down in this segment or in this channel by 4%, but what's the impact on the bottom line going to be in terms of us hitting our goal for the year? How confident are we that we're going to hit it now, given the, the miss or given the hit in the early part of the year? Um, so we'll touch on a lot of that today. Um, yeah, um, so, so moving in. Um, here's an example of a report that is pretty common, and this is illustrative data, but if you as a retailer are using something like Tableau or you know any other analytics platform, uh, you might come up with a report like this. Um, and this kind of just, with a real life uh, example, hits home on some of the stuff we were talking about, about living in a channel-centric universe. So you see the email marketing report here, open rate, click-through rate, conversion rate, subscribed and unsubscribed in the file, makes sense, high level email channel metrics. Um, you see cost per click numbers from paid search, you see percent year over year changes in that. Um, the lovely ROAS figure, which we all kind of love and hate, return on ad spend, meaningful way to try to get apples to apples, but kind of gnarly just because you know, you're kind of, comparing apples to oranges here in terms of ROAS with display, which isn't a real click generating thing and paid search, which is, and you know, they're kind of targeting different parts of the funnel and have different rules and how they determine the ROAS. But nonetheless, this is still data, right? You're going to see trends. You're going to see channel stuff. Um, it's going to show you some interesting stuff that you can use to try to make decisions as best we can in a world that, that doesn't have perfect answers to things like attribution and, and channel performance. Um, so as I said, right, like, you know, we all know some of these things have limitations, these things are valuable, but, um, but we can do more. Um, so, um, to kind of, you know, lead off with the punchline a little bit in a, this is an example of an additional type of report that we would say would be a very strong customer centric complement to the channel centric report. And we'll go through the components of these things one at a time because this is sort of an overview report that has a few sub reports within if you want to think of it that way. Um, but here we have a set of different metrics, right? And so I'll, I'm going to get back to the top line stuff that's talking about progress to goal with this customer centric lens. It's a little bit of a thicker topic that I'll unpack in a moment. But if you look a little bit down here on the screen, you're going to see things like a life cycle status breakdown. How many customers are, uh, are, are brand new? How many customers are on their typical purchase cycles? How many customers are starting to veer off, right? We have different shades of sort of at risk of losing the customer here. Oh, that's interesting. How is that trending year over here? Huh, interesting. Um, breaking that down with KPIs of how well are we doing at converting one-time buyers? I, um, I once met a CMO at like a top 10 retailer who said to me, if you can solve our one-time buyer problem, um, I will give you unlimited marketing budget. Um, and that is why we're in business today. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the quote was actually real though, um, that every single retailer that we face has a real one-time buyer problem. And, um, but we very rarely have worked with the retailer that has a KPI that's front and center uh, that helps companies track it. And so we have, we call it the early repeat rate, what percentage of one-time buyers relatively quickly convert into repeat buyers. We'll talk more about that later, but you can see uh, churn prevention, reactivation, user level metrics that you might have flowing around your org today, revenue per user, profit per user. Man, we get on our soapbox about profit. Um, we're all under so much pressure in retail to drive revenue because of course revenue is um, what the street reports on and, and so on. But in the day and age where promotions are now so freaking prevalent, um, not all revenue is really the same in terms of the health of the business. And so we are seeing, fortunately, I think, fortunately for the long-term sustainability of so many brands that in leadership, 
you know, there's a lot of um, walking the tightrope here or kind of trying trying to balance this need of we need that top line revenue number to grow. Otherwise, you know, companies in trouble, stock prices in trouble, jobs are in trouble. But we also need this company to live long term. And so we can't be so idealistic in many cases so as to only focus on margin, but we really do need to focus on margin. And that's a real problem when you think about the report we were looking at on the last slide of all of these return on ad spend, channel focused metrics, because the entire marketing stack lives on revenue. And so there's like this challenge of like, wait, I've got revenue needs, I got profit needs, but all of my tools are measuring only on revenue. And, and hence you get friction and the, the, the cluster, uh, the, the nonsense, I guess I should say, <laughs> that slows down from, um, that prevents us from really optimizing on some metrics like this. So um, anyway, moving on to the right side of the screen here too, we have performance of customer acquisition and customer retention in key segments and a heat map to get one layer deeper into, sure, your top line metrics might be up or they might be down this year, but why? Right? Is is there something going on with a certain demographic segment, like you know, group your customers by age? Is there something going on with your great high value customers ordering more or less than they used to, or your sort of middle of the pack customers that you're nurturing performing better or worse? All of these things we'll get into as we go through today uh, can make a real big difference on the decisions that we make and how we think and how we size up opportunities in the year. And so this is the type of report when you talk about customer centricity that takes it from being a, a kind of theoretical concept of, hey, yeah, of course, we want customers with that are high lifetime value that don't cost a lot to serve. Great. Um, but how do we make that happen? Um, it starts, you know, the you kind of are what you measure and it starts by setting the right KPIs and, and looking at your customer in the right customer base, customer population in the right manner so that you can focus on uh, opportunities and, and leverage insights in a way that actually makes a difference. Um, so more on that in a bit. Um, cool, so I'm gonna step through some of this stuff and then we'll go through some scenarios of things that we saw actually play out in the wild um, to give you an understanding of how some decisions um, the sort of companies realizing maybe the ramifications of some of the strategies they rolled out and how they course corrected with this information alongside their channel uh, and product centric reports. All right. So um, I, I went real quickly through this uh, because I knew we were going to zoom into it in a minute, but one of the big opportunities to leverage customer insights um, is when it comes to forecasting revenue. And so the basic premise here, what we can start with is to say, hey, look, um, generally speaking, the way that a retailer will forecast revenue is to take a look at some macroeconomic trends, take a look at some trends in the year. Hey, we're hoping to grow, you know, 5% year over year online. We're hoping, we know we're going to shrink, but we're hoping to only shrink maybe 2% year over year in the store. And you kind of do the math and, and, you know, maybe you have a new product launch and you kind of tweak some dials and it's, um, you know, it's rather complex and sort of, I say macro, it's kind of, sometimes there's some trends and some like regressions built in, but you kind of forecast revenue from the top. Um, I think of that as like a top down way of, of, uh, of forecasting revenue and it works. I mean, like there's, you know, people have been doing this for years and it's great, um, but there is another way. And again, I'm going to repeat the same uh, drum beat here. Um, what we've seen when we've talked to CFOs is they often talk about how, hey, when I set my quarterly predictions, I go to four data sources and now this customer centric thing is a fifth, right? So it's not meant to supersede everything else you're doing, but as a really nice additional lens. The way it works is as follows. You sit on uh, first things first with every single customer, you can run models to predict what will the existing base of customers spend over the next 12 months. Um, and there are some lovely customer lifetime value models out there. Of course, as a provider of customer intelligence, uh, we pride ourselves of having the best of breed in that predictive universe. But whether you partner with a firm like Casora or you have you know, your own uh, methodology, um, there are ways to project, hey, I have 5 million existing customers and here's what I expect literally every single individual customer to spend on me here. Um, then you also have new customers you're going to acquire. And you want to layer that in too, because ultimately the revenue a business will earn, one way to predict it is to predict, okay, 
top down, how much money are we going to earn based on looking that last year and tweaking the dials. In other words, to say, all right, well, how many customers are going to transact and how much are they going to spend? And you can break that down by my existing customers and what are they going to spend? And then my new customers and what are they going to spend? And, and you know sort of year over year customer acquisition trends and the seasonality that exists in every single retailer. And you, you kind of know how revenue waterfalls throughout the year. And um, it isn't the most straightforward snap your fingers and the analysis is done thing. Um, but you can put all this stuff together and you can come up with sort of a bottoms up based on the number of customers who will be transacting and how much they will be spending. You can come up with a projection on what you think is going to happen this year. And then you can apply, well, hey, we're doing some stuff with our product assortment, we're doing some stuff with our customer acquisition, we're spending a whole lot more this year, we're actually gonna ramp those goals up a little bit or ramp them back a little bit, and you kind of tweak from the base of the status quo based on what you're doing, and you come up with goals. Um, here, what we've done is all that work has been done, and so then what we're saying is, great, at the start of the retail year, right, Feb 1, great time to be talking about this because you can run all these stats right now and you can kind of come up for the retail calendar year on what you think your revenue on a month by month basis will be, or as the case um, is in this example, what your profit margin is going to be on a monthly basis. And so this thing on the left is saying, look, our target respecting seasonality that takes place in a year looks where those little vertical, you know, horizontal lines are. And then this is a glimpse where we're already partially, you know, two thirds of the way through the year here where revenue actually came in. So you can see on the left, a month by month basis of how we are making in the very first month and then missing the rest of the year, our goals um, through the first two thirds of the year. Um, and then over on the right side, you can see um, a, a summary of that. Great, so I saw the month by month look, but show me overall, how am I doing? Where should I be at this point of the year and where am I? Uh, how far under? You can even sauce this one up a little bit by saying, well, given that, how confident am I to be able to hit it? You know, in this case, they're pretty far under. There's only so many months to go. And so, you know, chances are more likely than not, you're not going to hit it. But you can actually use statistics to quantify that. Hey, there's only a 20% chance of our hitting goal. It becomes a little more helpful, those kinds of things early in the uh, early in the year when you kind of had two misses and two makes and you're like, all right, am I on track? And then you say, like, oh, all right, well, hey, the sum of all this, we're, we're only 40% likely to hit goal. And it kind of raises the alarm a little earlier in the year. But nonetheless, um, so this customer level forecasting is a really interesting lens. I would not say that this specifically tells you what to do, right? But it's kind of a, uh, an interesting additional data point to help CFOs triangulate around and try to figure out what can I expect is gonna happen this year and then how likely are we to hit those expectations and so on. Cool. So then you get into root causing the business drivers. Um, now, any business does this. We at Castora do it. I think, you know, the ice cream shop that you love in your town probably does it too. Like you, you look at, great, well, if we're hitting our numbers, we're missing our numbers, why? Um, and so here's this really interesting uh, waterfall chart where we're looking at uh, a little bit of, a, we call it actual versus target. And you're saying, hey, there might be some aspects like new customer growth where you actually beat your goal but maybe what those new customers are spending is a little bit down. And then maybe the number of repeat customers transacting is a little bit down and they're spending less. What we're doing here is uh, helping you size up. Look, you can see here is the target and here's where we hit. There's a gap, right, of what happened in September. What comprises the gap? Is the first layer of the onion. Uh, 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 of digging in, right? Is was it a customer acquisition? And there, we're kind of missing the, the 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 labels here on the on the graph. But the thing, the first green dot is number of new customers added. Hey, we actually did a good job there. That would have helped us beat our goal. But then the next one is dollars per new customer. Oh, that took some of that that goodness away. And then the next one was number of repeat customers buying. Big drop. Ah, uh, you're kind of helping quantify the source of the problem here. So if I were looking at this, I'd be like, the biggest hit here came with the existing customer base. It's not that our, our new customer strategy was um, not terrible. We actually got more customers. They're not spending quite as much, but net, that thing worked out pretty well. There was a repeat customers that really was the punch in the gut. Um, so again, you have a miss. Um, you might today be looking at, oh, was it that email revenue was down? Was it that same store that maybe the same store experience is down? People are using more promos or whatever. All those things are, are, are legit. 
But you also might want this lens to say, actually, the big problem in our business is repeat customers. Why? Right? And we'll take that even further as well. So then you dig down even further, right? So this would this would fall right underneath of that last graph. And you can see at the very top here, you've got new customers, quantity and spend, and existing customers, quantity making a purchase and spend. And what we've done here is pick three different like key segments that you as a brand probably know, right? Are kind of top of mind initiatives to do one layer of drill down. So um, it is very, very common within the CRM department and a lot of retailers that you'll see people talk about you, maybe a you group customers into deciles or maybe you have like a VIP program or a loyalty program and you're kind of tracking year over year. How are people doing in those programs and not another way to look at it is um, we, we like to group people into deciles or into segments based on those life, the lifetime value metric. But it's all to say, all right, are our great customers? Uh, spending more this year than they did last year are, are, I mean, all customers are great, but are the greatest of the great spending more than they used to? Are the ones that are sort of in the middle of the pack in that decile ranking growing, you know, coming more per year, spending more per year, um, spending more per visit, et cetera. Um, and so the top section here is one that we, we often see some variation, some flavor of this, of like LTV based segmentation. And what you're seeing here. Um, is not a, a, a great story, right? You're, you're seeing, look, from a new customer point of view, um, we've acquired a whole lot of low value customers. Maybe ease off of the Groupon addiction, right? Being a little oversimplistic. Um, and those new customers are spending less. Like, so what it means, like our one-time buyers are even worse this year. We're acquiring more of them and uh, they're actually spending less in that one-time purchase is a way to kind of quantify that top left thing. Then you go into the middle of the road customers and you're like, you know, we're, we're acquiring unfortunately a little less of those middle of the road customers and they're spending less too. Then you get to the very top and the, the danger in the business that we're looking at right now is, Man, look, high value customer acquisition is down 20%, 15, 20% year over year. What's not shown on the screen here, but that I promise is true in your business only because it's true in like every business we look at is those high value customers, like the top 10% might be driving 50% of your revenue of your existing customer base. It's just sort of the laws of retail that there exists that kind of concentration of those core customers who are really helping you guys grow your businesses and hit your, hit your goals. And for this business here, um, there's a big dip in acquisition of that cream of the crop. And that, that's a danger. That is a really dangerous signal for the future, right? Because this is going to set the, you know, the, the interesting thing when you talk about LTV, theoretical as it may be, it catches up with you, right? So if you are acquiring a disproportionate mix of one-time buyers this year, your revenue is going to be hurting not only this year, but next year and the year after. And so there's a little bit of a, of a customer acquisition story here, which is a big uh oh red flag here in the top. But again, right? Like if you're just looking on the whole here, quantity of new customers is up this year, right? That was the first little bar that we saw on this, on, on this slide, huh? But it happens to be quantity of really poor customers. And that's the kind of thing that why this sort of reporting is so important because it is so easy to make incorrect conclusions if you're simply looking, simply concluding that all customers acquired are the same, right? And this is like a way to kind of connect the dots from what we all know, hey, unlimited budget if you solve my one-time buyer problem. Yes, we, we, we hear that from CMO, but then CMO also treats all customers acquired the same. And, th and those two things don't add up, right? We know that repeat buyers are important. And so, um, you know, you get something like this. And, you know, you go down the list here and we have personas. I'll talk age, the one on the bottom for a minute, um, because this is another like hot, hot topic that we see often in so many retailers we work with. All the rage these days is about millennials, right? We have, how are we going to keep up the millennials? We need to acquire more millennials. Our customer base is aging. You know, the secret is that I think that the same exact conversation happened 10 years ago and 10 years ago and 10 years ago and 10 years ago, because there's a law of human beings that people age and then younger people get older. And so the, the, the reality is there's always a younger segment that is growing. And uh, today it is millennials, but it, it makes sense, right? Any business does have to think about the future. And if you can acquire somebody that is younger, you know, in their twenties and you can keep them for 30 years, then it's obviously awesome. That's like, you know, hardcore lifetime value. Um, 
but the, the where things get really interesting is more are the tastes and preferences unique based on those demographic splits and a word of warning is it is not always the case um, it is sometimes the case right there are some brands like some fashion trends and stuff where like younger people and older people like different types of goods right but there are also cases where that is absolutely not the case there are cases of like i'm in a tech industry and i think me and people 10 years older and 10 years younger all kind of wear the same hoodies right and it's not really defined by our demographics it's defined by like the little subculture and bubble that we live in and how we all want to look like each other and look like the people we see on the hbo sitcom and so like huh yeah all birds and exactly there's all these things that are not but like so just word of warning before you get too all into the millennial theme just recognize that um the buying preferences may or may not be different but in this example, this is a company, something we see a lot, which is that they made a concerted effort to acquire millennials. What did they do? They probably advertised on certain TV shows, hired certain models, advertised in certain publications, product placement in the right places, so on and so forth. And they did see an uptick, a huge uptick in that customer segment. But unfortunately, um, they saw a, uh, a decline in the rest of their customer base. And as is uh, sometimes the case with this sort of thing, um, what if those high value customers happen to be the older customers, right? Now you got yourself a little problem is it without looking at the lens of this stuff, here's this business that went real heavy into younger demographics that, may or, that might have been real heavy into low value customers potentially at the expense of the higher value customers that are a little bit older in their population. It's a recipe for problems. Um, but all that said, I won't go through every single cell in this, but just my rambling about this chart alone, you can see that there's so many interesting things for leadership to think about by simply going this one layer deeper. This is like layer two of the onion, if you want to think of it that way, right? We started with what was target, right? Then we dug it into new customers and new customer spend and existing customer and existing customer spend. And then we dug into three or four primary segments. The stuff in the middle is grouping customers based on like um, personas, right? Uh, comfort lovers, trendsetters, gifters, things that, again, for every retailer has their own uh, form of segmentation that they might be interested in looking at there. But this is the kind of stuff that leads to decision making. Um, this is a level higher than, oh, therefore, I will improve my email marketing and suddenly fix my business, right? This is which types of customers are resonating, which types aren't, right? The ramifications of what you do about this are kind of far reaching, right? To marketing, to product and beyond. But this is a really interesting uh, uh, way to kind of dig into the onion and, um, and, uh, uh, yeah the value of this customer centric reporting. So, sorry, I'm seeing some like questions come in that stuttering was uh, um, some good questions coming in, which we'll get to later. So, cool. All right, so an example of how this played out in the, in the real world, we're working with a women's apparel company um, and uh, they were um, spending a, a bunch of time really trying to think about growing in e-commerce, getting in control of their data, and the, the, the sort of before picture, before having these customer centric reports, the type of request would come down, and I hope this resonates with some of you, of uh, there was a board meeting or a C-suite, you know, monthly meeting, weekly meeting, weekly Monday meeting, um, and leadership wanted to do exactly what I was just talking about. Like, all right, how are we doing with millennials? Um, and Okay, so there might be some ideas on things that we can do. We can ramp up acquisition efforts for that age group. Let's kind of think more fashion forward with our product, like change the creative. We just talked about all of this stuff that you do when you wanna, wanna go after the millennials. And so as you roll those things out, great, so how are we doing here, right? You want like any, any organization, what you want are the KPIs in people's hands that they can make decisions related to those business objectives. You want data letting people know how is what they're doing helping us achieve the goal or not, right? The most basic, basic form, why we have KPIs. And so if what we're looking at is primarily channel-centric reporting, there's a problem, right? Omniture doesn't know. Omniture, who often reports on this channel-centric stuff, um, uh, or the digital marketing efficacy anyway, like doesn't really know who's a millennial and who's not. So you have all of this information about 
email and open rates and Google and so on and so forth. But uh, it's not really giving me too much like uh, material to chew on in terms of how I'm doing with those millennial goals. Um, I see site traffic is up. That's cool. I mean, I know I have been doing my advertising on some of these campaigns. And so I hope that that's, you know, related. Um, I see my page channels are up year over year in terms of, you know, ROAS. And I think that might be a good sign because I know sort of, you know, kind of directionally, I've been pushing to do more things towards millennials. Uh, email stuff's in trouble. Don't really know how to reconcile that because there too, we've been doing stuff for millennials. And, and this is sort of a common thing, right? It's, it's not crazy. Like people know what they're trying and they see the macro metrics. And so they kind of directionally have a sense, but, but it isn't super, super crisp. And then you see this revenue thing dropping and you're kind of like, man, how do I reconcile this? So I've got certain channels that are doing better and emails doing a little worse and the revenue's down. Do I attribute that all to email? Like, uh, I don't know. That kind of feels a little harsh. Like I'm a, I'm a channel retailer probably not only due to read like email. So like, so what's happening here? And, you know, then you go look at my same store sales year over year. But again, like this whole all came from a question of like, how are we doing with millennials? And none of this stuff kind of put together gives me an, an interesting, easy uh, answer to these questions. So um, what happens is like, okay, well, our pay channels are doing good. Um, uh, maybe we can work on website conversion. And let's start looking at, you know, add another email a week, you know, because those emails like clicks and conversions are strong, but maybe revenue is a little bit down. And that's the kind of stuff that people do. Um, when you have a report like this the com that we just showed you, the conversation changes. So cool. Now I'm looking at all of this lovely information. And I, and I already walked through some of the subsets here where I see millennial acquisition is up, but non-millennial acquisition is down. And I see that one-time buyers are up, but repeat buyers are down. And... Um, cool. Now, what do I make of this? It, it can really change the shape of the conversation. So what happens here uh, was, okay, we're missing our goal. Um, okay. Are we down revenue per user? Are we down profit per user? You know, like month, year over year, we're slightly down revenue per user. We're down 12% profit per user. Okay. This is kind of meaningful. This is interesting. Um, how engaged are our customers and how has that changed? Um, early repeat rate, right? And then you start looking into these sub-segments because this question was all about millennials. And you see what's happening with millennials. As we said, we're acquiring a whole bunch of them, but they're spending a little bit less. And the existing ones we had, there is a little bit of an uptick there with our existing millennial customers in terms of how many are making an order, but what are they spending, right? The, the spend per customer is actually down a little bit too. So it seems like this big push and all these TV shows that we've been targeting is doing a good job of getting some millennials in the door, but they're spending less. And the, the millennials that we had previously got before we started doing this hardcore millennial push, like they're not really turned on by all of this new, you know, advertising push that we've done also. And so that's, that's interesting um, and maybe not a good thing. And then you see also, Hey, look, we see this big uptick uh, or a big downtick, as I mentioned, in terms of high value customers, uh -oh, right? Particularly strong, not, not only in the, um, uh, the new customer acquisition, but a lot of our customers that have been really valuable customers, those ones that are in that concentration zone, the gold star, 10% of my customers driving 50% of my revenue are down pretty big time. I got the bad dark red color, right? And so, um, a story starting to emerge here. And on top of that, the comfort lovers, um, uh, we're acquiring fewer of them and we're seeing a big dip in the existing customers there. And a story is starting to emerge, right? It takes a little bit of art and science. I'll admit that even though we're a customer intelligence platform and we provide a lot of the science, like marketers still look at this and understand their customer base and apply like their own understanding here to paint the whole picture together. And what you're starting to see here is okay, we made a real strong push to acquire millennials um, and it kind of worked, but those millennials aren't too valuable. And by the way, there might've been some collateral damage here with all of this talk and all of this push into this like younger high fashion stuff, some of our older customers, and we made this like kind of intentionally trite, you know, in terms of the labels here for this, for this case study as we anonymize this thing, but our slightly older comfort loving segment that was like the core bread and butter of our business is down big time. And that's what's describing the myths. So how valuable is it to the C-suite to have an early sign that this hardcore millennial strategy that you're rolling out 
has a pretty substantial collateral damage impact on the rest of your business. It's it's pretty cool to get that information up front because now you can make some changes, right? Now, if you have this information, you know, in March or April when you get the leading indicators, you might recognize that you got to make sure maybe, maybe that's when you start triaging some communication and you say, you know, I do need to work on this millennial stuff, but I got to make sure I have good follow up. I got to do this good one time buyer conversion, right? Um, for the millennials and, and how can we do that? Um, also, I probably should look at the rest of my business and make sure that they're not getting so swarmed with like Snapchatty, new age, fashion, high trendy stuff when they're actually love our business because of like the comfort, love and clothing that I can wear to work and where to hang out with my friends. Um, if we stop sharing that, we're going to lose our core, right? And so um, it could affect, it could impact product assortment. It could impact communication. It could impact advertising. There's a lot of things that most C-suites would love to know six or seven months earlier about this kind of story um, because it enables you to make those big overarching decisions to steer the ship to course correct on a strategy that might have been taking you in a, in a direction that you didn't anticipate. Um, you can dig even deeper. Uh, once you have this, and this is kind of a, a, a common follow-up is like, cool. So I saw that stuff in sort of the, I don't know how many layers of the onion we got into here, one or two or three layers of the onion. And now I'm going to look into more. Um, and so d this is a, some screenshot of some deep dives into insights within Castora, but, um, you know, it could be through any other tool that you have that enables, you know, business users to quickly jump in and, and drill down into these insights. But perhaps there are, uh, you know, within the millennials, what you're seeing is here we have coastal cities is where the, the, the millennial customers that we are acquiring are spiking, right? With all of these things, there's double clicks to go further and further into the onion. Um, at some point, the onion analogy really runs out because then you get to the bad part of the onion that you always throw away. I'm going to stop. Okay. So, um, uh, but again, right, for different age groups, you might be over and under indexing, right? So maybe the um, that core customer group um, is actually still doing quite well or over indexing in like the middle of the country in the Midwest, but it's the coastal cities where that repeat buying core customer is really fading. And that happens to be where you are hardcore targeting the millennials. And so you can look at these things in a variety of different uh, perspectives um, and continue to drill down and bolster the case and more and more evidence to kind of paint a picture of what's happening in the customer base that's leading to change. Um, and so um, recapping some of this stuff, um, we have, uh, uh, you know, things before, if we look at traditional reports that are channel and product centric and compare them to the customer centric world, um, you know, we might see site traffic is up and say, hey, great, our acquisition is, is working, let's ramp them up. But when you have the customer centric lens, um, it gets a layer deeper and you say, all right, but what kind of customers are we attracting? And is it actually translating into revenue growth? Because you don't want to ramp up the, the common analogy I make there is the Groupon one. Not a lot of companies are, uh, you know, that Groupon isn't what it was in terms of a customer acquisition vehicle, you know, compared to what it was five years ago. But at that time, right, go back to the to simple ice cream shop. Like if you're, if you're, if everyone who's coming in the door gets a 90% off your ice cream cone, you're going to acquire a whole lot of customers. It's not really going to help your business too much. Not unless those customers come back and pay full price, which unfortunately for a lot of businesses and ultimately therefore for Groupon wasn't always the case. Um, and so it's not enough just to say site traffic is enough, is up. It's not enough to just say customer acquisition is up. You have to look one layer deeper and understand the lifetime value of those customers you're bringing in. Um, traditionally, you see ROAS is working. All right, keep doing what you're doing. ROAS is, is awesome. But when you have the customer centric lens, you realize, you know what, uh, maybe not. Um, it, how do the stats look in terms of the numbers of customers that we are acquiring in the key segments that we are spending, right? We don't look at just, hey, I spent five million bucks overall and how much revenue came in. If those five million dollars were intended to acquire, you know, one million millennial customers, um, did they or did they acquire 100,000 millennial customers, right? Look in reference to the goals you set when you're going to track this stuff. Um, Email engagement is down and, and unsubscribes um, are, are not down. So, hey, maybe I can send an, e an additional email. Okay, but if you have the customer lens, you might realize that actually when you cross these things, you see that it is the millennial customers who are totally disengaged with the email. 
Um, and so, um, and, and, and crap, we actually are targeting our emails all about millennials. So we got big problems here. We, we realized that number one, we're ignoring the core base. Number two, what we're trying to show these millennials isn't even working, right? Like it, you, all of these things come together and layer on additional color. It's like, it's like black and white to HD color, right? As you're thinking about what you can do to uh, to tweak the dials here and to improve things, and it and it works both on the on the micro channel level, like email marketing or you know Google search marketing, and also sort of all the way up at the C-suite as you're making bigger decisions about uh, product launches and product designs and and inventory decisions and so on. Um, ah, yes. Um, recapping again. Hey, revenues down. How come? Um, well, typically we'll, we'll see things like, all right, we're going to invest in on-site conversion. We're going to double down on, you know, like in-store events and things that might make sense. And we're not, it's, it's not even that those things are wrong, but you, you, what you might not be seeing is that you're at, that the combination of the things you've done is actually alienating your core customer. That one who, who when, you know, looking at that segment, well, it only represents 10% of your base. It's half of your revenue. And if the collection of micro things you're doing are kind of setting you off with that core set customer group, um, it can spell big problems down the road. And so um, these types of reports are very helpful to, to surface those things. So I just talked about all this and move kind of quickly through it. But um, so, so yeah, you know, so how, how do we see this play out? I think I've talked about a lot of themes today that are not just in the marketing department and not just in the CRM department. And this makes sense. Uh, it was a lesson that we learned over time, um, you know, kind of starting with our roots in marketing technology is that this stuff is not just um, a marketing exercise, right? To be customer centric, right? If I were to look at Castora ourselves, marketing is a part of what we do, but so is product. And so is the team that works with our existing customers. And so is the sales team and they all come, uh, they all come, you know, and, and, and to be a customer centric company, everyone's gotta be on the same page. We have to find it, we have to nurture, we have to impress, um, you know, we have to surprise, we have to delight customers and, and, and retail is the same thing, right? The reality is secret. You cannot solve your one-time buyer problem with email alone. It's just impossible. Right. Especially if you are an on the channel retail brand. Right. So you need these teams to work together. But how? Right. Because like you need to do it in a way that doesn't require massive organizational shift. What we found is that by breaking these challenges down, breaking these questions down by articulating what the goals are and then surfacing key customer insights for relevant people from these different teams in the context of the goals and how their world applies to the goals, um, it's pretty awesome. Right. It, it, this isn't like transformative organizational redesign. This is giving them a lens into customer intelligence, into customer insights that can help all teams work together and make certain decisions come together to drive growth to the business. Um, and so there's a cross functional leadership team that usually exists. It's called like the Monday meeting. Right. Um, and it's layering something like this in and being intentional about the goals. Um, and there's a whole other topic we could set on customer centric goal setting, sizing up the opportunities. Should you be looking at millennials in the first place? Um, what does it mean? Do they do they act differently than the rest of our customer base? And what's the what do we try to drive? You know, more customer acquisition. Do we try to drive more visits? Do we try to drive more revenue per visit? Um, all of these things to kind of size and focus on the right customer goals and then flowing intelligence around them can make a really big difference. So um, now the comic book changes and we're in this lovely nirvana of, hey, we're having trouble connecting with our high value customers. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna roll out a VIP program to show those high value customers some love. We gotta get back those comfort loving, you know, 30 to 55 year old customers. We're gonna revamp the email program to make sure that we're not turning them off with uh, too much like Snapchat, goggly kind of things like we were doing in the, in the, uh, in the millennial focused emails. Um, and we do want to still work on those millennials, but we got to figure out a way to tweak those dials, We're requiring a bunch of one and done millennials. So, okay, let's look, take a look, not just at ROAS that's really uber focused only on purchase number one, but let's look at within the millennial group, which channels are attracting the repeat buyers. Let's double down on those channels and ease off on the one and done millennials and try to course correct here to maintain the strong base while growing a healthier millennial segment.
So takeaways here, um, channel-centric reporting alone can lead to some pretty funky decision-making. We went through a pretty concrete example of that, how um, you simply might be looking at new customer acquisition is up, giving a high five to the customer acquisition team, when in fact, they're actually creating a big, big problem by adding a lot of dead weight to the business that's gonna really make goals this quarter and for the next six quarters nearly impossible to hit. Um, we talked about customer-centric metrics being really important to understand the holistic impact of strategy changes to not only look at the target segments that you were focusing on, but if there's a, a ripple effect on some of the other segments. Uh, we used a really bad joke about onion analogies going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper down to really understand um, the, the underlying behavioral changes and sub-segments that are driving a hit or a miss. And we talked about um, building successful long-term marketing strategies, which is all wrapped up in that lifetime value theme, right? When you acquire more of those repeat buyers, they're the ones that are visiting your site every quarter. They're the ones that are ripe for that website conversion that you invested so much money in or for the card abandonment that you invested so much money in. All of those things matter. And when you invest in these customer-focused strategies, you get more at-bats with every single one of those tools, right? It's like, a, it's like the funnel before the funnel, if you want to think of it that way. I don't totally know if that makes sense, uh, but um, but cool, you know, and, and we've seen it work, right? Like we have customers in the past who have rolled out different variations of reports like these and talk about things like a never before seen level of precision in terms of what client health, what customer health looks like. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that this additional lens of customer centric reporting can, can, uh, can really help with. Um, Sweet. So with that, um, done with my ramble, but I think we have some time for a couple of questions. And so, um, yeah. Let's see what came in during the webinar. All right. So first one for you, Corey. What is the best tip you have for reducing one-time buyers? The best tip I have for reducing one-time buyers is to not think that there's a best tip for reducing one-time buyers. Can I do that? It's it's only a half joke. It's like uh, I I could I could talk about this for a long time, but one-time buyers is like it's the tip of the iceberg of what is indicative of a sort of a um, I'm going to be intentionally over harsh and provocative here, but when you're blind to things like lifetime value, you get big one-time buyer problems, right? It's when you don't give a damn about CLV that you just acquire as many freaking customers as you can. You don't care about the rest and you get this problem. What You can't just fix that with an email trigger or a welcome series. It actually takes quite a bit, right? And so I think the first thing to do, quantify the impact of improving your one-time buyer conversion rate. It's it, mathematically, this has nothing to do with Castora, right? Just mathematically, if you convert a higher rate one-time buyers and repeat buyers, you will be amazed at the revenue unlock it will drive for your business. And then how do you do it? Um, I, you group that stuff into two buckets. There is what you can do with marketing. And don't think about a single email here, a single touch point. Think about a marketing strategy of taking a customer who just bought a product and educating them on the variety of different products that might be of interest to other people that are similar to them in terms of their preferences, that informed by what similar people have done. Um, that... We could talk differently about how to set that up. It, that might sound impossible from a logistics to orchestrate that across your marketing tools, but it's not. You can do it. Um, there's so much advancement, fortunately, with tools not just like us, but with all of your marketing execution tools. A beautiful thing that has happened over the past five years is that most marketing tools play nice with each other nowadays, right? While all of them sort of stake a claim to like being the, the one marketing cloud that can control all on the channel, consistent messaging everywhere, all marketers know that's a big crock of shit. Nobody, nobody can deliver messages in every single channel synchronized. Like even the, the Salesforce, the Adobe giants haven't gotten there yet. And they've got a whole lot of money to throw at the problem. But you have a collection of marketing tools and fortunately, they all integrate. Right, which means that there's some setup work that can be done to engineer, to pulse customer intelligence, same playbook through these tools and you can do it. But think of it like a series. That's the marketing touch point. The other half of it is like getting the people in your org um, rallied around this thing. So which customer acquisition channels are driving one-time buyers? Which products, when people buy them, do they tend to repeat a lot? There's a collection of things. You don't want to only make this the job. You can't say, hey, 
unlimited budget to solve my one time buyer problem. So by the way, go, go fix that email marketing manager, right? Of course that makes no sense. You need a, you need a team working on this thing. And so when you can flow the insights in across the different teams that are all playing, lending a hand towards the state of the one time buyer program, and you can find ways to get your marketing tools working together to solve it. That's when you move the needle, but it isn't like a plug in, drop a pixel, boom, make it rain, my one-time buyer problem is fixed, is that just happens never, right? So, um, but I will say, you can do it, right? It does happen. And when you get these pieces in place, the unlock is is huge. Big, big, big time revenue growth. And you can read our One and Not Done book. And we have I an have awesome One and Not Done book that walks you through your whole organization on how to do it from crawl to walk to run. Uh, and Paul Rudd is on the cover. Yeah. So. Um, uh, this looks like a half question. So I have another question for you. Um, paid channels, performance marketing. So you talked a bit about ROAS, but how mm, it's not the best metric all the time for measuring performance of paid channels. How do you reconcile that with customer-centric metrics? So, right, there's a, there's a fundamental high-level challenge here in measurement, which is that channel marketing tools like Google display, Facebook, they can only report on the revenue that's passed in the pixel and the conversion, right? It's the only thing that, that these tools know about. And so, um, but here we are talking about two things. We're talking about margin, which isn't revenue, and we're talking about lifetime value, which is like kind of a future thing. And that makes optimization hard. Marketers need to optimize on the today and they need to optimize on the concrete. And here we are talking about a different set of numbers and a long-term version of those numbers and how those things mix is, is pretty complex. So um, every channel is a little bit different, right? And the goals that you have with top of funnel display are different than the goals you have with like bottom of the funnel uh, paid search conversions in terms of what they're intended to do in the buying cycle and so on. But um, there are ways to do it. So um, when you are able to run at scale and in quote real time, the lifetime value predictions on new customers, you can get a pretty early read on, Hey, okay. I acquired a hundred customers from Google and a hundred customers or a hundred customers from Google keywords on jeans. And I acquired a hundred customers on Google keywords on sneakers and they all paid the same and purchased one. But if you know that the jeans shoppers are more likely to be repeat customers and higher value, the ROI of that in, in the back of your mind should be higher. Right, um, because these those are the customers that keep on giving. They're in the cool 10% that drive all my revenue. I'm willing to spend even more on those. But you need some way to automate into your process the long-term profit or long-term revenue analysis that goes along with um, the numbers of customers you acquired. So you can almost think of it like multiply number of customers acquired and maybe predicted total spend in one year or two years or lifetime, depending on the horizon that is important to your business. Um, stack that up against your customer acquisition costs. Now, that's a little oversimplified because people will continue to like um, uh, come back on paid channels later. And again, it, get, it gets a little over, or it gets a little bit complex, but all solvable, right? Like the bottom line is factor in the lifetime value impact along with the customer acquisition impact together when you're assessing ROI. Um, and there are certainly ways to do that. Um, it gets, it does get fuzzier when you talk about non-clicky channels because attribution and who gets credit for driving this purchase um, is still a, a problem that the industry hasn't solved yet. But you can kind of think of it in two waves. There's like multi-touch attribution tries to answer for you who should get the credit. Lifetime value can inform you how much credit, right? So these two things work in concert together to help you allocate your uh, advertising and marketing dollars towards the channels that attract those magnificent profit, sustainable company building core customer segments. Awesome. I think we are out of time for today. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining. Um, we have another webinar next week on ways to reduce promotionality um, hosted by our head of product, Jordan Elkin. So I hope you guys will be able to join that. Um, and we'll be sending out the recording either today or by tomorrow morning at the latest. Thank you again. Have a good one.